Welcome to the Barbarian Hour podcast, where we conquer the impossible. The Barbarian Hour podcast is presented by Barbarian Apparel. Here is Jared Opfer and Zeb Miller. Are you ready? Hello, wrestlers and coaches. I'm Teague Moore. I spent 20 years coaching at the Division I level in the NCAA, 15 of those years as a head coach. During that time, I helped a lot of wrestlers and parents navigate the recruiting process. I've now opened my own consulting business to do just that, to help you navigate the recruiting process. There's a lot of unanswered questions. How do scholarships work? What program would be right for my son? Or better yet, what coach would be right for my wrestler? I can help answer these and many other questions. Feel free to email me or call me at the information listed below, and we can set up your first consultation today. I look forward to working with you and helping you make the right choice. Oh, the road dog. We got the road dog, Coach uh, Josh Roden, the former head coach of the four Pete. It was a four Pete at Clackamas, right? It was, yes, sir. Four in a row, five overall. Five overall. So you were five time junior college national champions at Clackamas Community College just outside of Portland, Oregon. Correct. And now you are making the move. The big move down I-5 to Corvallis, Oregon, Oregon State. The Beavers coming off a phenomenal NCAA tournament with four All-Americans. Damn right. Uh, I mean, really, really, really good team. Uh, some of those guys coming back. Some of those guys not coming back. Mm -hmm. um, I, are you guys determined on who's coming back and who's not coming back to Oregon State yet? You know, that's a great question. Uh, we're still working through some of that. I think, you know, I know Devin's done uh, for sure. He graduates, he's exhausted his eligibility. And so um, outside of that, I think we're, you know, still trying to work with some things, see if we can get uh, some guys to uh, recommit to the idea of uh, chasing this dream together and then, you know, taking it from there. So Willett's brothers, they're twins from Colorado, both all Americans this year. Yep. Um, one of the, the biggest upset obviously was 157 pounds for me at the NCAA sure. tournament. Um, so, I mean, to be able to get both Willits backs or one Willits back would be huge, obviously, for Oregon State. So, right now, we obviously know Turner's off the table at 133 yep. pounds. BK comes back at 25. He's, a, he's an absolute stud. He had a great year this year and really made some huge gains. So, that's exciting to get him back as well. So, I don't want to leave that off the table there. And then, you know, just some other really good kids that are going to be a part of what we're doing going forward. I think they, they have a good nucleus, you know, that comes back and – um, man, if we could get those two brothers from Colorado speaking directly to them right now, it's, <laughs> it would be uh, fantastic, dude. So Both my nephew, dude. my nephew Ian coached those guys. Yeah, of course. Ian Miller coached the Willets brothers, and then he right. was. Um, I think Kevin Roberts is actually the person who recruited him. Yep. Isn't it wild? It's, it's, it's crazy wild how this is all tied in. The together, connection, man. right? Wrestling is yeah. beautiful that way. I think. Yes, definitely. Um, so. I met you this summer at Kevin Roberts' dungeon in Nine Mile Falls, Washington. You're doing a camp. You're an amazing technician, by the way. I appreciate uh, that, brother. It, it, listen, like how you are, you're descriptive, you're having fun. The kids enjoy it. It's not clinic moves. It's nice, basic stuff. You're doing like arm out on the back, almost like a Blair ride type thing. With sure. Some of the stuff I saw, you are doing um, just turns from top, from bars, tilts, all, a bunch of different stuff. It's actually on Go High Outcast if people want to go watch it. Absolutely. I'll probably, I, it, I, actually, I'll probably tweet some of the links out just because uh, you're one of my favorite clinicians to watch. I was telling Kevin that. I'm like, this guy, he's an excellent condition, uh, clinician, and you're engaging. But once again, not clinic moves. Because some people show clinic moves, right? Yeah, no, 100%, right? You, gotta th you throw some junk out for fun. But I like to show it as a series, right? Series is something I could apply myself if I was a young man coming to a clinic. That's what I liked the best. And so I try to do that. And then an education background makes it easier to teach it, right? Like you can put it together, have a plan, and then execute it, right? Absolutely. Okay, so let's get into this. You okay. are a native. You are native to Oregon, correct? That is absolutely correct. Crook County High School is where I went to high school. Uh, people know it now because Tyler Berger's awesome and wrestled there in high school. Um, and uh, went to Clackamas actually myself as a student athlete and then uh, got my master's and my undergrad from Pacific University out here in Fort Grove. Which is uh, NCAA Division three school at the time, yes? Correct. So um, we were talking about that this summer. You talked about and, you know, you didn't get everything you wanted to get out of, out of wrestling at Pacific. Is that correct? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. My path was a uh, clackamist and PLU is where I went. Pacific Lutheran had a program, division three as well. Uh, dropped their program when I came back from the NCAA championships that year, like literally the next day we got back and uh, dropped it. And so didn't uh, quite complete the path that I had set out for myself. And a lot of it was, you know, due to things between the ears. Right. And uh, I, I just knew as a coach that that's something that I wanted to make sure that I never had to uh, have guys repeat. Right. So I tried to, I got an undergrad in psychology, a master's in education, because I knew I wanted to coach and figured those would help me be able to teach it a little bit better and, and uh, relate better with the athletes and, you know, maybe understand them a little bit, get between the ears. Um, and then, you know, honestly, the rest is just kind of faking it till you make it right. Like you, you get a 26 year old kid as, as a head coach. Um, and that first year it was, you know, baptism by fire a little bit. Um, but then, you know, just making mistakes for fa failing forward really. And, and uh, you know, learning from what I didn't do very well and, and uh, trying to make sure that I didn't repeat those same errors. So you're out there in the Pacific Northwest. There's not a ton of Division One wrestling. Right. Uh, I think Portland State's been dropped a little over like probably 12 or 13 years. Yep. Same Oregon, Oregon State. Oregon State's the only in-state Division One program. Oregon doesn't have it. Nope. And um, the thing about Oregon that people don't realize is it's a massive state, and there's only between like 3.5 and 4 million people. Right. throughout this massive state so it's like twice the size of ohio right but it's ohio is like uh, 11 to 12 million people right, right. so it's wild and I, I i talk a lot about people out west the travel thing the what you guys got to do for travel is insane and being a juco up there like you guys were at clackamas what was the travel like for you guys and are there more junior college opportunities than there are division one opportunities in the west yeah, good question. I mean, maybe it's more practical to say there's more uh, small college wrestling opportunities because then it allows Clackamas to wrestle some teams that are similar in makeup and build, right? Oregon State, you know, the NCAA has rules on what are countable matches towards your season record. Uh, and so they can't necessarily just schedule a Southern Oregon or, or a Clackamas and, and have that date make sense for them anymore. And so uh, we've lost that from the Oregon State vantage point. From Clackamas' vantage point, you know, there's five teams out West uh, that were in our conference. Uh, there's the two in Colorado and two in Wyoming. So at least, you know, out here, there's a, there's two good solid conferences of teams uh, that we could get competitions with and, and find uh, matches, you know, for uh, same with opens, you know, there's a lot of small college opens, uh, Spokane, Clackamas has one Pacific hosts a couple uh, Southern Oregon always had one forever. Uh, that was a really good one. And, and so there's opportunities for our kids to get plenty of matches without having to go crazy distances. Now we did figure out that, Hey man, we got to go see, you know, the Iowa Centrals and the any Northeast Oklahomas and Western Wyoming's of the world, because those are teams that you've got to know where you stand if you really want to compete at that level. And so um, early on, we, we started fundraising real hard at Clackamas to get the opportunity to go to the national duels or get out to the Midwest or the East. Um, and so, you know, we'd go to everything from Reno to Indiana and Oklahoma as much as we could uh, given the year. Right. And so we just felt like that was something we had to do, but again, it was only maybe the one trip or two trips a year where we would, you know, find our way out there while we could still get the competitions we needed to prepare our guys, um, you know, out here, out West. Uh, that's, that's not necessarily the same case. Obviously California is going to help us out with seeing Stanford and uh, Bakersfield, Cal Baptist and those schools uh, at the division one level. Um, but certainly there's some, uh, there's some travel now uh, required to get to what you want to get to. So California does a different junior college system there. The California teams do not participate and the national junior colleges, they just do California JUCOs. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah, they have uh, something like 22 teams, uh, a north and a south division, and then they have their state championship is what they call it. So they have it. So, like, I, I watched the uh, – they did a football one. They did a basketball one out in California for, for Netflix, uh, Last Chance You, right? I don't know if right. those are the best. Is that the, necessarily the best representation of what JUCO is? Do you feel like that's the best representation of what you guys were doing at Clackamas? I mean, was it, you know, was it like dealing with ex-convicts and all this crazy stuff? Was it like that? I guess you can deal with that if you want to. That's not the way we approached it at our place. Uh, we had a lot of great young men uh, who were looking to chase their dreams, really. Uh, now, did we take some chances on kids? Yeah. But my personal opinion and my philosophy and our staff's philosophy was we can only take as many chances as there are guys on the staff, right? If it's a one-to-one -one kind of kid where you're going to take more staff time, then we can only take four guys because there's four staff members that can help manage one of those people. Um, now, that's like on a rebuild, a bounce back, a kid who's had 
some type of issues and hopefully they're not um, extenuating circumstances that go beyond the pale of my ability to, to, to work with. Um, but we would, I mean, junior college is there for that reason, right? We want to help kids have a second chance and I'm big on second chances uh, in terms of given kids opportunities. The chances I'm talking about, though, are different than ex-convict type chances. I mean, if, if they've done something terrible or they're in trouble all the time, there's a the history there, then maybe that's beyond what I'm able to, to work with in, in my position, you know, as a, as a wrestling coach. Um, however, if it's academics or maybe you've got some other social issues or, or uh, something along those lines that we can help you just as life coaching and, and you know, working by side, side, shoulder to shoulder, doing life together, then that's exactly what we were there for. And we did a lot of that for sure. There's no question. So um, I love the second chances. It's really easy to motivate guys who feel like people are doubting them. And, and a lot of these kids either had counselors or coaches or parents or people who didn't believe in them at some point in their journey. Uh, and they got to us. And so we use that man as motivation. You know, no one expects you to be here. No one thinks that you're good enough and let's go show them that, that they're wrong. And, so it's easy to easy to motivate guys that way, if you know what I'm saying. So four titles in a row. What was the what was the individual outlier title? Because you won 19, 20, 21, 22. You won those four in a row, right? What was the outlier title? You had five titles. What's the fifth title? The, the first fifth, title. Yeah, the first one was in 2011 uh, with guys like Tyrell Fortune and Brett Sanchez, Kagan Hanlevick, and and those guys. Uh, they won the first one for us. And truthfully, for about five years, Zeb we spent trying to get back on top of the mountain and maybe trying to take shortcuts in recruiting or, or not doing our due diligence on kids and, and taking chances on kids that were ex exceedingly great at wrestling and not uh, very well put together in other areas. And, and it cost us, it really did. We were trying to chase getting back there because it was so awesome, right? Like nobody expected us ever to get there. They couldn't spell Clackamas, let alone tell you where it was at. Um, and somehow we got on top of the mountain and we wanted to get back there. Right. So we had to make some adjustments. We did, uh, it took us till we got to about 2017. Uh, we got a bunch of seconds. I think we had three or four seconds, um, three or four thirds. Wow. Um, we just That's didn't sustainability though. Like people don't know. Oh, yeah. I, if people over are the life oh, of it. winnings, the only thing that matters. Sustainability is incredible. Yeah. That's hard to do. Yeah. 16 total years there. We got eighth once we got seventh once we got sixth once and fifth once everything else is third or better. Uh, so 12 times uh, we finished in the top three. Um, and that's, I mean, it's a testament to the guys who we had working with us. I had great staff members. Rich Vigorito has been my buddy since we were at PLU and known each other for 20 years, right? And we just grinded together. At first he thought I was crazy taking a junior college job and he kind of laughed at it. And then, you know, we, we started really getting in and, and doing the work and, and working with the kids. And then, you know, we had Daniel Leonard and Brett Sanchez who were former athletes that came back recently within the last five years and helped us. And, I mean, it was just an awesome, awesome experience. Uh, we had a great uh, academic advisor who loved these guys. He's a great academic coach to them and, and really helped, you know, guys uh, earn degrees and con continue to pursue degrees at a high level, um, Eric Pfeiffer. And, I mean, just awesome from the top down. Clackamas was a great place for people, still is. It is uh, PDX, as I like to call it, Portland, which the yeah. airport code is PDX. Right. It's a wild place. <laughs> It can be, man. If you, if you, if you want to find, find it, you can certainly seek it out. Uh, thankfully, Oregon City's, I don't know, what is it, 25, 30 minutes to the southeast, you know? So we're a little, we can, we can stay out of the fray a bit. Just, you're right by the mean streets of West Lynn, aren't you? We're really close to the mean streets, man. Me and, me and Chell go way back. He's a great friend. I worked at a club uh, with some high school and, and kids club that he, uh, him and his buddy, Kevin Keeney, uh, college roommates at Oregon, they found it together and um, have a lot of great uh, opportunities to hang out in the mean streets with that man. He's a good dude. Okay. So you win four titles, five yeah. in 16 years. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the sustainability, 12 top three finishes for second or third. Yeah. That's incredible. Uh, you get to the end of this, right? You guys didn't lose the COVID year. So I don't think, I think that that's confusing to some people. A lot of States got their state tournament in the NCAA tournament got canceled in 2020. You guys did not. Cause you're a February national tournament. Isn't that correct about Juco? Yeah, we, we actually moved it to the first weekend in March, but that was just after that we got back and Tuesday yeah. after we returned, everything stopped. That's crazy. So you guys yeah. just got it in, just snuck it in there. Like literally the weekend. And then two days later, everything shut down. Yeah, we were traveling home and our trainer was like, man, I'm, I'm kind of concerned about this stuff. I think it's going to, you know, it's really going to cause some problems. And a couple of days later, our basketball team was set to play in their championships and that we were going to host. And 
everything started stopping. NBA stops, you know, obviously that was the first yeah. domino and then on and on. Yeah. So you guys, you win, you guys, you win four titles in a row, you know, 19, 20, 21, 22. You're, you've done this a bunch of times. You're, you're, it's your fifth title. I always get like really confused when I see you. Cause I always think you're like this 30 year old guy. You're, <laughs> how old are you? That's a good question. Uh, 42 is the number. Um, Dude, I, you look I, amazing. You, look, have, you do I've not look blessed. like a 42-year-old man. I'm going to put that out there. I've been blessed genetically, that's for sure. I've been asked lots of times if the coach can bring the card down and pay for the rooms over the years, I can tell you that. <laughs> they should. You look like it. You do look like a young whippersnapper. But <laughs> so, so you're 16 years into this thing, yeah. right? You didn't wrestle D1. Nope. You were a JUCO guy and a D3 guy. Nope. You've been coaching JUCO. You're a JUCO guy. And we talked last summer, you know, about, eh, is it there? And, you know, we just had some general discussions about – because, you know, that, there's been D1s that have been talking to you, right? They like you because, obviously, yeah, you're a winner. Yeah, no. a winner and at all levels. Yeah, no, I appreciate what that. Did we, what did it? What? Why? Why Oregon State? Why yeah. now? After 16 years, you're pretty comfortable, obviously very comfortable and familiar with the system at Clackamas. Why now? Why Oregon State? That's a great question. I appreciate you asking it. Uh, truthfully, it's the probably the one D1 job I, or the one other job I was going to leave Clackamas for. And uh, Coach Pendleton offered me the opportunity to, to chase a, a little bit of a dream and, and see if the skill set translates, which he obviously saw something as well and, and, uh, and asked me to take the opportunity and take it seriously. And, uh, you know, I considered it and mold on it. And, and as the story goes, and I've told it a couple of times is, you know, as last year I had, I said, no, thanks. Just cause we had some kids we'd recruited and promised some things too, that we wanted to fulfill. And when I say we, I mean, my wife and I, and you know, that we, that's really important to us. I mean, I take taking care of kids, children seriously. And so, um, you know, we wanted to do that and, and, uh, it came back around and Chris says, well, let's put a pin in it and talk about it next year. And, you know, they do so well at the NCAAs. I told Carrie it when we were watching the NCAAs from home. I said, there's no way there's a chance still because, you know, nobody gets to jump on a top 12 team uh, as a staff member, let alone a small college guy, right? It just doesn't happen. And so um, he actually circled back and he says, hey, when do you got time for lunch? And I said, well, let's, let's start figuring it out. So we figure out a lunchtime and uh, the rest, as they say, is history, man. That's awesome. When I saw it, I was pumped. I was like, yeah, good for that guy. <laughs> you guys freaking earned it. The road dogs earned it. If anybody's a road that. dog, dude. Yeah, um, right. that's true. It, you, dude, you've earned it. And, and obviously, Chris uh, recognized that. And I talked to him a lot at the NCAAs. I think he interviewed him. And he's the coach I interviewed the most because they were just having such an amazing tournament, man. Yeah, kind of the Cinderella story, like basketball's version of the Cinderella story, right? Like, they, they really were wearing the glass slipper. And the, and the kids just competed so well. And they wrestled so hard for, for the staff. It was awesome, man. It was really cool to see it. So, um, if you look over my left shoulder, there's yeah. a backpack right here. Yeah. I don't know if you can see what the backpack is, but I can see the orange and black and that's good enough for me to know. It's not orange and black. It's no, gold, it's gold and black. And Brandon Courtney, Courtney wanted to fight me for it. <laughs> wait, 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 which Brandon Courtney, right? For, is he the 25? It's Brandon you know, Kaler, Brandon Kaler. No, 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 not your guy. The no, no. Arizona State. Oh yeah, Brandon backpack. Courtney, correct. Brandon correct. Courtney, Brandon Courtney wanted to fight me because it's an Arizona State backpack and it's only a team issued one. So I'm just putting it out there. That's what that is right there. It's just put a mental note. You can put a. You can put a. Put a I might be out at K Rob's this summer. You can put a pin in that. <laughs> bring me a backpack. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Right Courtney on. wanted to fight me because he thought I stole their backpacks. Oh my <laughs> gosh, dude. That's funny, but. Just keep me in mind if you guys got it. I've got something special for you. Okay. I'm just, I just, listen, I like to put, I'm shameless about it. Okay. No, it's okay. I get it. You got to be. <laughs> okay. So, big thing for you is, you know, you've been up there. You've had your family, you've built your family in, you know, in, um, in Clackamas. Right. And, and uh, Oregon City. In Oregon City, in uh -huh. near, near the mean streets of Westland, just outside of uh, Portland. You have your family there, you have a young family. Now you got to make this like, is it a move? Do you stay in Oregon city? What do you do? What's the next move for you guys and your family? Well, that's a great question. So my daughter's going to be a freshman in high school and my son is going to be in first grade, you know, which is a little bit easier. Freshman high school got our best friend group ever. Um, and you said it, man, the nickname's the road dog and those are earned, not given. So I'm going to drive it uh, for a while. And it's about an hour, hour and 15. Not bad for me. It's actually I mean, not a bad some... drive because it's right. It's down I-5 through the Willamette Valley. 
I'm legit going the right direction in the morning and in the afternoon. Yeah, you're going out, you're going out and then yeah. you're, you're doing a reverse commute. So it's correct. I mean, I five North this morning was awful. I mean, awful for miles and miles. Now on my side, I'm going 75 and killing it. So, um, no problem there. Uh, I told my daughter, Hey, we're going to, we'll a year, you know, let's just look at it and see, you know, how doable is this? I can commit to that and we'll, we'll revisit in a year and figure if we need to move and you know, sell the house or what do we do? And so, I think, you know, that's kind of my job as a dad is to make sure I don't mess my kid up. Right. So I'd, I want to make sure and provide her the same opportunity that uh, that I was offered from my parents. And so my dad always worked late nights and, and you know, drove all over. He's a logger. And so um, he made that commitment and move us around for jobs. So um, I'm going to try and do the same thing and honor that as, as her dad. So we'll see how it goes and, and we'll kind of revisit in a year. But for right now, I'm going to continue to be the road dog. Speaking of being a logger. Yeah, you knew, I had, you knew I got to bring this up. It's a great segue. <laughs> I mean, it's a terrible story. It's an awful story. You could have lost your like hand. Right. Right. But Ugh. what happened to you and what did you do for your summer job when you were in college? If I was slower than slow as most humans and not as fast as I am, I probably would have lost my whole hand. So I have four fingers on my right hand. Um, and uh, these two, the one that you can see is fused in the joint. Both got cut off in a cutback saw in the planer shed. Planer sheds where they surface the wood. A uh, glove got caught. Uh, I pulled it back really fast, what I thought was super fast. And I thought, whew, that was close until there was like a burning and tingling sensation in the hand. And I flip it over and I'm looking and I'm like, glove, no glove, glove, no glove. I'm, you know, kind of lost a little bit. So I flip it over and my fingers are still barely attached by skin on the backside and they oh. flop. It. And so, and you look at the hand and you know, oh. the first fingers cut actually in half. There were several stitches in this one. I think 60 or 70 total stitches in the hand, which is a lot for a hand. There's not, yeah, because there's not much to stitch to there. Right. And so, and then down here, there was a, there's a big old gash that had stitches and you know, the whole thing. So, um, it actually provides me the opportunity to run the fastest four and a half fingered half Nelson in America. So when you do that, do you wake up when you have a traumatic situation like that, yeah. you look down, you're missing fingers, right? Did they put you out or are you conscious the whole time? The, 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 so for the ambulance what, ride, the yeah, surgery. Yeah. You, yeah. So for what seemed like an eternity, I was conscious in there. I was, you know, obviously woozy and a little bit, shocked but the guy running the feeding the planer was more shocked when i showed him and screamed at him that he's got to get me help he almost passed out i had to grab by the shirt and say hey you got to get me help and he hits the emergency button and stops everything and you know they start helping me so the ambulance ride from the the lumber mill to prineville's hospital which isn't a very big hospital uh i was you know they were starting the ivs and stuff and i think they started me on something uh get to the hospital and they're like hey we got to transport you to pete to emmanuel in portland which has a hand surgeon um, and so it's going to be a helicopter ride because I'm three hours from Portland where I live, where I grew up. And so my brother comes in and he, and what longer story that I don't know if I'm referenced with you was when he was about two, we were cutting firewood with my grandpa and my brother's uh, first finger got cut off by a, cha a hatchet that I was wielding. Um, and so he says, karma's a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I look at him. I, and I'm like, I did not I know even... this part. I, you never no. you did not tell me this. Yeah, I did not reference that. So, um, but he says you that cut your brother's face. finger off. Yeah, what a hatchet! Tip. It was just a little baby tip comparatively. I'm like, dude, I don't even know if I got fingers left. I say, get the heck out of my. That's brothers for you though. And so they fly me up to Emmanuel and and uh, took care of me up there. What, do you remember the helicopter ride? Uh, yeah, I do. And then they put you out for the surgery and put everything, put the one back on where you're fused. Which one's fused, right. your ring finger? Yeah, ring finger on the right hand is fused. Uh, the middle finger, actually, the doctor was like, yeah, I think we're, we're going to be fine. We'll stitch you up, no problem. Um, he was in surgery uh, before he came to see me, though, so it took a while. I was literally just laying there for a couple of hours waiting for him to get out of surgery because he's the best, and that's the guy that does the, the surgeries, evidently. He was the only one at the time, I guess, and um, – so when I wake up, I'm looking and there's, you know, it looks like this and I'm cast it and I'm looking in there. Like they said, it'd be in there. I must've folded it down and son of a gun took the freaking finger off there without asking, you know, you're not supposed to do that. He told you it was going to be no problem. And then you, you wake this. up and your fingers. Come and I don't have a finger. And I was like, we didn't, I don't know if I agreed to that, but I mean, obviously I was like, you got to do what you got to do. Cause he yeah. said, you know, Hey man, there's just wasn't a lot left to attach. And we were worried if it'd get gangrene that could affect the whole hand. And that I, 
You don't want that. Road hand. dog, you don't want that because then you got no hand and you got no arm. And- no, dog. That's the truth. And and he fused it because I could still grab. So I could still grab because I was still wrestling. I was 19 and I was in college, right? So I had to relearn how to write because that was obviously harder to do because you don't have these fingers to grab the pencil and type. So I took a, a semester off and uh, went through some hand therapy and redid that stuff and tried re- writing left handed at first. And it was awful. I mean, it was terrible. But uh, yeah. Yeah, man, got to figure it out. Drop some change for a while through the hole in the hand. You know, I had to figure that whole thing out. Um, you know, the and little kids. What do the pre- little kids say? What do the little kids say at the clinics and at the camps? What do the little kids say? You know, that's the thing that most most little kids. Here's the thing: most adults don't know, right? Like CP didn't know uh, until like literally five days ago, right? Like, oh, what? You don't have a middle finger. Most adults don't get it. little kids are perceptive, man. They're like, yeah. look, so I taught, I taught second grade my first year right out of my master's program. And so you got to talk about it, but I would always convince them at recess. They need to help me find the other half of my finger. Cause it was lost. Right. I lost it. I lost it. And they think concretely at that age. So, you know, they think that we're on a, we're on a seek and find and we got to go find that stinking thing. So I usually tell them and then, and then they can kind of move past it. Some of them want to touch it or see it and, and understand that I'm not doing a, you know, grandpa pulling his finger away thing i can't really do that thing i just have this one right but but you know what i'm talking about i got you i'm with you uh okay so (laughs) i love pendleton didn't even know he might get more of the story now so you hit the ground running you are already there are you gonna do club what's coming in right now because you and i are talking here pacific practice yep rtc practice coming in um guys lifted this morning so they're coming in to get some work uh, this afternoon and just kind of keep training. We've got a couple of guys that are getting ready uh, for U23s and, and we've got uh, Kodiak and, and Caleb who qualified for the Greco World Team Trials. So getting them ready. Isaiah's getting ready for the last chance. I mean, we got, you know, we got a lot going on. And so um, excited, man, just excited to be able to be here with these guys and get to know them all better, right? Like that's part of the thing. I got to visit with Matthew Olguin today. He was, he was out and then I was out with Vegas and finally got to just sit down and visit and we've got a lot of connections with the central valley kids and so we were just rapping about that today and you know just trying to build relationships man that's what this is you know i mean go anywhere i was in vegas and i didn't know that many people actually knew who i was like you just don't know right? i'm a junior college guy so um everybody's shaking my hand telling me good job and congrats and stuff and i'm like i didn't even know you knew who i was you know but um you know wrestling's cool that way we're a pretty interconnected group and i know we all want to beat each other's brains out at the end of the day at the CAAs, but uh, there's a, it's a good, you know, culture and, and club of people who uh, really are there to, you know, help people move forward. And so that's pretty awesome. And so just trying to build those relationships here with these kids. That's really what it is. And, uh, help them in the recruiting process now, buddy. I mean, that's really what it is, is we got to really bottle up that lightning that they captured there at the NCAAs and, and now go and, and tell kids, hey, listen, you don't have to leave uh, the West Coast and you don't got to go to the Big Ten to chase your dreams because, you can do it out here in the beautiful God's country of Corvallis, Oregon, man. And, you know, it's, it's not something you got to chase someplace specific. Uh, you can come be the dude out here um, and help us build that dam. So the big thing there, like I just, you know, you're from the same high school as um, uh, Tyler Berger, but Tyler Berger actually went, he's from like Hermiston, Hermiston, isn't he? Yeah, he was a Hermiston kid for yeah. two years. His grandparents and his uncles all attended at Crook County and they always lived in the area there. Um, and then he ended up wanting to finish out, you know, his, his dad's uh, and, and his uncles are both decorated in the, in the wrestling room there. And, you know, they were great wrestlers in high school and stuff for Crook County high school. And I think there was a little bit of sentimental attachment to that. And they provided him the opportunity to go there and, you know, help those guys that I think his last, last year, or his last two years. But yeah. So, you, you know, you look at that, he leaves the state and I guess I bring him into it and I'll bring Whitley. Right. Like those are the two easy guys to talk about building the dam sure. um yeah obviously they bring you in to build the dam even higher bigger not and create barriers but those two guys are easy right off the top of my head right you need to keep yeah, right. those guys in state guys like that guys of sure. that caliber need to stay in oregon what are you going to do and why do they bring you on the staff and what's your role on the staff coach Roden? yeah no thanks uh for asking that i i tell you i think part of it in recruiting i, I really enjoy it um i've built a lot of great relationships myself in this community uh, in oregon and the wrestling community and throughout the west coast and and even you know extending east we've had a lot of pennsylvania guys and east coast kids out at, at a clackamas i think that's that's probably intriguing to, to coach angle who also is big in recruiting here obviously nate's one of the best and um and, and to coach pendleton in terms of you know program development how do we get somebody else that has head coaching experience 
per Chris's words, we want somebody else who understands, you know, the CEO position in a program and, and who can help recruit and keep kids here and, and, uh, you know, build relationships that, and continue to cultivate relationships with, um, families and kids who, uh, we want to keep here, man. And, and, uh, and our alumni base and our donors want us to keep here. And so I think that's been a real thorn in the side for some of the, uh, the guys who were in the, uh, Coach Wells era and, and, and beyond that really want to see the homegrown kids be here and, and wear the orange and black and be in Gill Coliseum winning matches for us. And I think that's a big part of it, you know, and so trying to keep a Tyler Berger or a Travis Whitlake from, from having to go somewhere else is, is definitely a big part of what we want to do going forward. There's no question about it. I think it has to start there and it has to start with uh, this community of, of our wrestling family here in the state. Um, and so certainly going to be a big part of what I, what I try to do to help these guys. All I'm doing is helping them push the ball a little bit faster, and a little bit further forward. Um, they've done a great job, man. They've laid a great foundation and have things really rocking. There's no question about it. So two headgear throws at the pack, 12 championships. Uh, one of them obviously cost Oregon state, the team title. Obviously that is something that is sticking in their minds right now. And they want right. that title. They want to bring the pack 12 title back to Corvallis. I mean, obviously, that's not even an elephant in the room. Everybody knows about that. That's a huge thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, first practice plan. I'm, first practice plan I'm writing is going to be don't throw your head kick, right? We'll practice <laughs> holding on to our head. It's simple, right? Like, I mean, let's keep it. Let's let's just keep it simple. We'll yeah. just we'll practice unstrapping it, and then we'll hand it to the guy in the corner. And so, I mean, I say that just joking, but you're right. That's painful, right? I mean, yeah. uh, one of the stupidest rules ever. And in, in, horrible, in awful, stupid, ridiculous, counterproductive. Terrible rule. If I spike a football after a touchdown, Terrible. you don't take the touchdown off the board. It's, it's unbelievable. L listen. I, and it can go for both listen. with Arizona State and for us. It doesn't matter to me. Yeah. yeah it's yeah, just yeah. the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Horrible. Horrend horrendous. Having thing said that, we're going to keep on hold of our headgear. Okay. Tell me what your goals for Oregon State are. I, we're on a timer. Yep. I have to upgrade my my uh, my my program here. Yeah, yeah. We got six minutes and twenty three seconds to talk about your goals. Okay. And we're cut off. Wait, you're, be you're, the, you're, I've been there. You're a baller on a budget, dog. I get it. So hey, listen, I'll I'll help you quickly. One is to 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 truthfully cultivate relationships, uh, bridge the gaps uh, that that may be there or perceived gaps that there may be in. Uh, our alumni and our supporter base. I think that's the most fundamental thing that we can probably start to do is to just reinvigorate, re-energize, and reconnect uh, with the groups of individuals who are st stakeholders and shareholders in what we're doing. There's no no better way to start um, because I think it begins there. And once we get those people, which Chris already has done a great job of, of being excited about uh, the product on the mat uh, and the direction of the program, he's already done those things. Um, now it's just a matter of reaching back out to those folks who are a lot of them who are head coaches of high school programs who are involved in club programs who are going to be coaching the next generation of beaver wrestlers. And so um, I think that's fundamentally where it starts in terms of goals. You know, uh, Chris gets paid the big bucks to, to set the goals. I would love to see us bring a Pac-12 title back here. There's no question. Arizona state's obviously a formidable uh, foe and, you know, a, a great rival. Um, and so, we got I see the backpack too. I mean, that does, it, it stings a little bit. I'm not going to lie to you. And I only barely know, you. but um, <laughs> to be, tr to be truthful in order to, to have a great rivalry, we got to hone up our end of the bargain and we got to go out and chase it. And so um, they're going to be tough to tough mountain to climb, but we're going to, we're certainly going to set our sights out there. And, and I think, you know, I would be lying to you if I said, I, I wouldn't hope and dream that we would be back into the top 10. You know, I think that's, that's something that everybody would want to have, but, uh, wrestling at the NCAA level is a zero sum game. So who are we going to take out uh, of that top 10? And, and, and are we going to be able to score enough points to get, you know, in that position that's been vacated? And really that's, that's going to be up to the next, you know, eight months or so of, of coaching, recruiting, you know, work development uh, and a lot of different things. Now I'll tell you this, uh, they have a great culture. Uh, I walked in here in the first RTC practice I was in and it was full. I mean, there's 25 kids in here. Um, the, I go to the lifting on at 9 a.m. the next day. I asked CP if I could go in there, and because uh, I before I was the I was the head weight weight training coach as well. You know, I was a lot of different things at Clackamas. Now they have buildings of people who do the jobs I used to do, right? Um, and so it's a different level. But I wanted to be in there to see who's in there. And, you know, I go in and I'm surprised to see without prompting or anything else, there's 22 guys that are in there lifting and and working hard and doing their job. And that part's done. It's, it's built in. I mean, they've got it already. And so they've got the buy-in of the kids that are here. And so now we just got to get, 
you know, the next type, the next level of kids that we're trying to recruit in the process. Um, and if we can start doing those things, man, I think we're gonna see some really special things out here. I don't, I don't have any doubt about that. Just, just in the conversations I got to have with Pendleton and Isaiah and, and Nate, it's just a special place, man. And I'm, I'm excited about uh, these three men uh, that I get to share the office with and, and uh, the rest on that with, there's no question. I mean, you get a lot of questions before I've gotten a, you know, me and Engel being non-traditional Division One coaches, and and Engel says, you know, you can stick that in their their tailpipe a little bit, you know. But I, hey, I, I'll own it, man. I'm not a traditional hire, uh, and I'm grateful for the opportunity that Chris gave me to be here. Uh, and I can promise, I t same thing I told him. I'm gonna work my butt off here, um, and and we're gonna we're gonna be exceptional, come hell or high water, just because that's the kind of dude I am, man. <laughs> Do you feel as young as you look? Like, are your joints? Do you wrestle that much? Do you feel like there's a lot of like? I mean, I, this isn't like I'm asking like a oh a, like a like a Joe McFarland, right? Like a guy who right. was on his his last couple of years, you know, in Cleveland, right? Like, it's not like that. Like, you're a young looking 42 year old guy who looks 30. Do you feel like that? Do you feel like a young guy like you look? I do, and I think it's intentionally. Like, I wake up every day excited to go to work. I'm happy to be around my family. I love what I get to do. I'm super blessed. God's been really good to me. There's no lie in there. Um, but I'll tell you, my knees probably are 80. That's the only downside. Like, when I wrestled the last couple of weeks with the guys, that was my biggest problem is I got a left knee that gets a little cyst in it and gets pissed off, and so I got to ice it down. And you got a cyst cool. in your knee? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I've had – listen, I had ACL reconstruction in both knees, and I've had – six total knee surgeries three on each and so it's been it's been a process right and so knees my dad screwed me genetically so i'm kind of just where i am right there but uh, other than that yeah man i feel that i feel as young as that is now i tell i'm all the time I, I like spark the advocare product i don't sell it but i do love drinking it and i like caffeine i'm a junkie i just don't like the fizzy stuff you know the kids yeah. all drink i used to do red bulls when i was younger and i just i thought it was going to kill me um, but I'll, I'll drink the crap out of coffee and I'll drink some spark. That's no, there's no question about that. Dude. That's where I'm at. Coach Roden. I feel like, uh, we're going to have to do a part two here. I would I get love my that, upgrade. Man. And, uh, yeah, I, once I, you listen, upgrade to premium, well, I'll be in the premium. <laughs> I appreciate you coming on. I know you got practice coming up. Yes. Thank, thank you. you for the time. Thank you for coming on barbarian hour. Sounds like the barbarian 40 today, but we'll get you back on here for part two. Coach, thanks for the time. Good luck and go Beavs. Hey, thanks so much. Go Beavs.